good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on what time it is where you are in the world watching this recorded video. I wish I was in the UK presenting this live at SQL Bits, but COVID-19 had a few other plans in mind. So instead, I'm recording it here in my office, here in the Boston area across the pond. Hopefully I'll be back in the UK next year for SQL Bits, one of my favorite conferences. But until then, we'll all make do, and I hope you enjoy this session. Let's get on with it. So for the next 50 minutes or so, I'm going to be talking to you about distributed availability groups. Distributed availability groups are a variant of availability groups that you should be aware of because they have some great uses, but there are some things that you should also know about them. Let's get started. Now that the requisite SQL bit slides are out of the way, let me give you a brief introduction to me and tell you a little bit about why I'm talking to you about distributed availability groups. So I've been working with SQL Server since 1992 back in the Sybase days. I've been working with clustering in Windows since, since the Wolfpack days of the late 90s before it was an official feature. I'm a dual Microsoft MVP, both on the Windows side, which is the cloud and data center management. My category is high availability, which used to be a hog cluster. And I'm also a data platform or SQL Server MVP. I'm also a VMware V expert. I live, eat, sleep, breathe these kinds of things with customers every day. This isn't something I just do in a lab. And in fact, I have quite a few customers over the years since they were introduced who have used distributed availability groups. So some of my experiences are going to be reflected in this talk. Just a quick agenda of how the next uh, little while is going to go. First of all, I'm going to introduce all the changes in a very compact way of how AGs have evolved in basically the past 10 years. You know, and then after that, you have a sort of a basic understanding of where we are to where we've come. What are distributed availability groups and why do you need to care about them? And finally, I'm going to go through some use cases and show you a demo. If you couldn't tell by the agenda title, AGs were introduced in SQL Server 2012. Personally, I've seen them longer than that. The first time I saw them was probably two years earlier in a, in a conference room in Redmond. So I have 10 years with the feature. It's a great feature. It provides database level protection, which means anything inside the database is accounted for. Anything that sits outside the database, such as instance level logins, SQL Server agent jobs, that kind of stuff isn't automatically taken care of if another instance of SQL Server has to pick up and you fail over to it and be your new main thing, right? Now, the instances participating in an availability group are called replicas. And as the way it's architected in 2012, you need an underlying Windows Server failover cluster or WSFC underneath it. So it's another clustered configuration of SQL Server. And that's why I mentioned that last bullet point there because AGs are very different than always on failover cluster instances or FCIs. They don't require shared storage. And that was one of the hardest things to get people to understand was that they heard the word cluster, they heard the word SQL Server, and they immediately thought FCI. That's not the case here. You don't need that shared storage. You could mix FCIs and AGs, but that's not something that you have to do. You can use that replica, which is that instance participating in the AG for other things if you're an enterprise edition. And we'll talk about when things were introduced in standard here in a slide or two. So it, you got FCI-like functionality with standalone instances none of the hassles in some cases of FCIs, and they've been generally a really good feature. Now, there are a lot of variants that have been introduced over these past eight to 10 years. You know, what was introduced in what I first saw in 2010 are just called availability groups or AGs. That's the enterprise edition feature, if you will, right? And that's been there now again forever. We didn't get AGs in standard edition 
until SQL Server 2016. Microsoft unfortunately decided to call it its own feature called Basic Availability Groups, but it's not a different feature. It's just Availability Groups and Standards, so you won't ever hear me say Basic AGs because it's just an a, you have an AG, you either have standard edition or you have enterprise edition. Now, but if you're going to use basic AG, please don't call them bags. I beg of you. In 2016, we also got domain independent availability groups, which means you still needed an underlying cluster, or in this case, a Windows Server failover cluster, but you didn't need to have the Windows Server failover cluster that was domain joined. There were some pluses and minuses to that. The situation got better with Windows Server 2019, but just know that that is, you don't need to have Active Directory to deploy, even though you might be using a cluster. In 2017, we got AGs in Linux. I'm not putting it here on the timeline because it was just part of the the SQL Server deployment, you know, you could use AGs or not, but it was in the product. So it's net no new change other than the fact that we got a Linux version in 2017. Now, besides getting AGs in Linux in 2017, we got something called a cluster type. What's a cluster type? Well, we now basically have three ways to deploy, if you will, an AG. Two that require a cluster, there's obviously Windows Server failover cluster, external means you're using Pacemaker, and none, which means you technically don't have to have a cluster underneath. That is that read scale availability group or read scale group configuration in 2017. That is also enterprise edition only, and it's meant to scale out your reads. It's not an availability configuration. Please don't use it as such. There's no automatic failover. But again, just another variant of it, and you create that, again, with that cluster type of none. The final variant of what I call normal availability groups is what's in big data clusters in 2019. So big data clusters, you can look that up if you want to know more about it. It's using Kubernetes, it's using containers. And those of you that have a little bit of a longer history may remember this part of the CTP builds and I have actually a blog post or two around how to configure this, that AGs were part of containers uh, when they were released in 2019. Um, but unfortunately, it didn't make the final cut for regular configurations. It, it is in big data clusters, so you can use AGs with containers there. I'm hoping in vNext, or, or what's after 2019, depending on when you're watching this, we'll get AGs in containers. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because it's not totally relevant to this talk, but anybody who knows me knows I'm a bit of a stickler for using the right name for things, and always on is not the name of the feature. It's always on availability groups is its full formal name or just availability groups. The abbreviation is AGs. It's not AOAG, AAG, AOG, any AO, any combination of that. So, and even always on these days has a space. So again, just I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here just to realize, and I hope going forward to use it correctly. All right, that's all just sort of the foundational type of stuff. And if you're unfamiliar with availability groups, when I do the demo later, I'm gonna talk about the little bits and bobs a little bit more. So now we're gonna get into what exactly are distributed availability groups. Now that you, we've, now that we have a foundation for AGs and where we've come, let's talk about why we have distributed AGs or why they were introduced. Architecturally, AGs are fairly straightforward. Let's take the type that don't use a cluster out of the mix for a second. It, you just have Pacemaker or Windows Server Failover cluster. You deploy AGs on top of it. It's pretty straightforward. However, that's where things start to take a bit, bit of a left turn for some folks because, for example, if you're setting up a multi-site environment, all those replicas participating which sit on nodes of a cluster, 
have to be part of the same cluster, which means you've got to account for availability. And we'll see this more on the next slide. It'll make more sense. So, but that also means you're tied into it, like Linux, same distribution, Windows, same major version of Windows. Generally, there are some edge cases where you're doing some upgrade -y kind of stuff, but it's not meant to be a permanent configuration. And I don't want to get into those variants here. But just understand that it's meant to just be samey all around, meaning ver major version of SQL Server, major version of OS, single cluster. It's pretty monolithic. And what does that look like? It looks a lot like this. Well, not a lot like, it is this. So if we look at this picture here, this would be a typical DR type scenario. Now, this would be Enterprise Edition. If you have Standard Edition, just imagine one primary replica and one secondary replica. But this makes the point a little bit easier to show. So I've got my primary replica in my main data center, and it is feeding a replica that is in that data center as well. So that's my high availability strategy. So if something happens in my main data center, Assuming I have synchronous and automatic failover, things should just work. Now, when I say data center here, it could be on-premises, it could be physical, it could be virtual, or it could be up in any one of the clouds. It, data center is a concept here, not an actual thing, if you will. Right. So it doesn't matter here if you're using in the cloud and using AWS, GCP, Azure, it doesn't matter. Right. This is just conceptual here. And the other data center, so if we're talking cloud here, this would be like another region. So assume like, for example, data center one might be on-premises and you have a hybrid to say whatever region you have in one of the clouds, or DC one could be one region in the cloud and another region in the same cloud, or maybe you're doing a multi-cloud strategy, right? But those secondary replicas that are in DC two are being fed by the same primary replica and part of the same underlying cluster. So you're starting to see here where this very tightly coupled architecture, you're worrying about quorum. Okay, so for example, how am I gonna do Stoneth and Pacemaker? What's my witness gonna be for a Windows Server failover cluster? In a Windows Server failover cluster, do I alter votes or do I change in and configure site awareness, which is a later feature of a Windows Server failover cluster. All these things need to be thought through because clusters rely on network connectivity. And if you cause your cluster to go down, that means the AG is going to go down. So that's why all these other things start to come into play. Now, look, we've been doing this now for almost 10 years. This is nothing new. But it's one of the pains of doing this type of architecture, okay? It's just being real with you. So let's talk about distributed availability groups. So I apologize to those of you who are using standard, but it is an enterprise edition only feature. I'm hoping they officially support it in standard at some point. Came in in SQL Server 2016, and conceptually what it is, is an availability group of availability group or AG of AGs. The AGs participating in a distributed availability group are on their own separate configurations. It's not one monolithic cluster. And you're gonna see that here in a moment. Now, the interesting thing about this, and you'll see this when I get into the demo, is that it's a SQL Server only construct. So you're not gonna see the distributed AG in your pacemaker or WSFC. Now, it also makes for interesting things like, say, mixing OS versions. And again, you're going to see some of that as well in my demo. And this is what it looks like. Now, let me explain a few things here. So right now, you notice I have no arrows for the most part on that AG2. Let me explain what all this is. So we've got same basic picture. We've got instead of AG, we have a distributed AG that spans both data centers. Except in this case, we've got two separate clusters, be they a WSFC or a pacemaker. And we have two separate availability groups. That means things like quorum, like what do I do for witness? That's local to that data center. You're not worried about if this whole big thing tips over, is my availability group gonna go down? 
your local availability group will go down if it has a failure locally, but that other AG and the other cluster aren't affecting the first one. Now, a few things I need to point out here. The You'll see P1S1, P2S2. So P1, or the primary of that first availability group, is known as a global primary. That one is the one that synchronizes S1, or the local copy there in subnet 1, or DC1, and as well as the primary replica of the second availability group. That second availability group, while it has a primary, it's not a normal primary, it's not a read-write copy. So it is like a secondary replica in that it's not available for writes, but it is still a primary. And again, I'll show you this when I do the demo. That is called the forwarder. And why is it called the forwarder? Simply put, it then synchronizes all the AG replicas on that side of the house. So you don't have one big monolithic architecture here. Now, obviously this has some challenges and we'll talk about what some of those are. For example, you're now maintaining two clusters and two separate things all together. And there are more of them, but that's at a high level right now for purposes of this slide, the most difficult part of all this. But what's nice here, and again, you'll see it in my demo, is that like that dark blue cluster there that has AG1 could say be Windows Server 2012 R2. And the one on the right there that's in gray could be Windows Server 2019. Interesting, right? So just chew on that for a second. Okay. Before we get into the demo, I want to quickly go through the use cases because I just want to go right into the demo and then we're going to wrap things up at the end after the use cases. So the three real main scenarios that we're talking about here, disaster recovery, kind of obviously. Migration, so it could be same data center. I showed you the picture here that was DC1, DC2. Technically, this could be the same data center, right? And let's say you wanted to keep the same version of SQL Server, but you wanted to migrate OSs, like I said, from Windows Server 2012 to Windows Server 2019. Cool. You can do that here, right? So that's really nice. You can also scale out readable replicas by stacking your distributed AG. Now, what does that look like? So think about that picture that I showed earlier, right? Each local AG synchronizes itself, if you will. But that forwarder, for example, that second Windows Server failover cluster there could also be Pacemaker, could then be the global primary for another distributed AG. Or you could have this. the You could have two AGs based out of the original global primary feeding different other AGs. So it's kind of an interesting concept here, right? Now, obviously, you got to worry about licensing in all these cases. And if you're using these for reading, sc scaling out reads, this is obviously going to get pretty expensive. So just be aware of that, right? But it's kind of interesting to see here how that works. Now, I do have some customers doing things like this. For example, one customer who's doing a migration is using a distributed AG. So they basically have this architecture where they're using that first Windows Server failover cluster configuration to feed what is their new, what going to be their new primary. And then they're going to have DR using distributed AG. So they configured that a distributed AG already and it's feeding the other AG in their other new data center. So it's kind of a very cool thing here, right? So now let's go have a demo. I'm gonna explain what I have here in a moment. This is going to be a distributed availability group. And I'm gonna walk you through also what a failover looks like, but I'm first gonna walk you through the basics of what I have, 
how to build a distributed availability group. In this one particular example, there are other things I could potentially do. But my goal here is to get you to understand the entire architecture of what this all looks like. So I'm just pulling up two separate virtual machines that I've created here. There are more in this configuration that, that matter, but I'm going to just show you two of them. So what I've got here, so first of all, is I've got four instances of SQL Server. Each one of these is a standalone instance of SQL Server that's been configured to have availability groups. And you see that with the is HDR enabled. I'm going to show you what it things look like underneath the covers a bit more, but the that is clustered is false means that it's not a clustered instance or an FCI of SQL Server. And that's true. The other ones, I'm not going to go through all of them and show you that. Just trust me on that one. So four instances, all they're going to be participating in various availability groups. Now, here you can't tell where these things sit, what OS, but you can tell they're all the same version of SQL Server. So 13.0.15.37.0. Now, if we go look here, a little cheat sheet, it's some flavor of SQL Server 2016 Service Pack 2, okay? Now, if we go look at the cluster layer, now, first of all, let me minimize SSMS because I need to drive something that I talked about earlier home. This particular server, which is named Dennis, is probably gave it away up here, but it's SQL Server 2016 running on Windows Server 2012 R2. So it is just a two node cluster that has Dennis and Tommy. So if I go quickly back here to SMS, there's Dennis and Tommy. Here I have my AG, got my listener, which is really a network name and an IP address, yeah, the cluster layer. Here's my AG resource. If I go look at Dennis, which is currently the primary, you can see here, hey, all looks good. Now what it, what happens is, is the AG okay? Why yes, yes it is. I said yes before that came up, so I probably shouldn't have done that. All right, so it's pretty standard stuff. So Dennis is my primary replica, Tommy is my secondary. If we look at the configuration here, both synchronous, manual failover, I'm gonna switch this to automatic, so I may do a test, time dependent. Um, but let's just do automatic failover here, okay? Just in case something happens. Now it's my, you see that change there, but again, neither here nor there for this demo if I don't show some automatic failover here. Then I've got these other two which have a question mark. Now you'll see why in a minute, but so again, these are just instances of SQL Server running the same version that Dennis and Tommy are, but clearly they were not part of this cluster or this AG. So what are they? Let me switch over here to this other VM, which is sitting behind. If you see me doing this, I'm just trying to get out of the way of my camera because I'd set it up in a certain way to record this. So I'm going to crick my neck just a little bit. This is real. You, you know, I'm not just making this perfect. So Okay, here I have another Windows Server failover cluster. Now, don't worry about that, there's no witness. I'm gonna explain why here in a second. This is my demo lab in a real world environment, you would have a witness here, okay? This right here, it has, you're probably gonna see it coming, the nodes of Gowan and JY, which were, drum roll please, the other two, instances shown in SSMS. Now, if we look at Gowan, you will see it's the primary for an AG called a Cyclorama AG. If I go out here and look here, guess what I'm gonna see? So, two different AGs. Now, the telling thing here, which is why I showed you the background, 
and which is why you're not going to get confused. So sorry for my head moving here and going around the camera. Is that this is Windows Server 2016, not Windows Server 2012 R2. So completely separate cluster, as you can see, but completely separate OS version. And notice here, this is not domain joined. So this is one of those domain independent availability groups I talked about earlier. This is a completely different setup versus here, this is fully domain joined the whole nine. Looking at Cyclorama AG, you'll see that I don't have any databases. Let me close this. I'm going to explain why in a minute when I go through the script. So the first thing you need to know about distributed availability groups is that there's no wizard, there's no GUI. It's only T-SQL right now. So if you're not liking T-SQL, this is not for you. Now you see here about certificates. The reason I use certificates here is that on my other AG, which is Rengate AG, that was all domain joined. But obviously with the other one not being domain joined, the two need to be able to talk to each other and that's done through certificates. Another thing that was introduced in SQL Server 2016. So I'm not gonna bore you with all this stuff, but I'm gonna sort of scroll through the creation script. And you'll see here, you know, I created my endpoints, I use certificates. Now what you have to do after you kind of do all this rigmarole is you create logins and users on the corresponding instances for all the other replicas, essentially that are, could be potentially part of the distributed availability group. And you, you grant it properties or grant the ability to connect to the endpoint that allows everything to talk to each other again makes sense right but you have to think about this because this is the part that a lot of people can screw up endpoints are going to be one of the hardest things to get right in all of this especially if you're not in the same domain using necessarily the same say accounts stuff like that you may have to worry about granting connect to another login potentially so just be aware of that. I'm going to sort of scroll through all this because basically you'll see Gowan gets Dennis, Tommy, and JY. Um, you know, JY will get Dennis, Tommy, and Gowan. You get the point. All right, here's the availability group I created. Now, I also created a listener. I happen to do it via the GUI. I could have done it via T-SQL. So that's another key component here that we're going to see here in a minute. I'm, I'm going to get insert some values, but I just have this T-SQL here for now. The listener is absolutely required for a distributed AG. Because if we start going down and looking at the creation, which we're going to do here in a second, the distributed AG is created and for the endpoint URLs, first of all, notice it says listener URL, whereas here it says endpoint URL, okay? So that's one difference. Another difference is it's using the listener names, the respective listener names for each of these. So again, if I just quickly look here, it's Cyclorama. So if you're not in the habit of using listeners or you have a reason that you can't use listeners, then distributed AGs are not for you, okay? Just be very clear about that. Now, to create the distributed availability group is not super straightforward. I'm gonna make sure, all right, so I'm connected to Dennis actually. So to create this distributed availability group, I'm going to run this on Dennis. Hopefully one error out of me. Awesome. Now let me make this a little smaller so I can. Now to join, because I of course ch changed this right before I start recording this demo, I need to make sure that matches. Now to join, you run an alter availability group on the distributed AG and notice you have the join here 
but you also have all this other stuff. Now, one thing I need to talk about here is I'm gonna use automatic seeding. Again, another feature introduced in SQL Server 2016, which allows the availability group, in this case, distributed availability group, to automatically create the databases on the other side. Now, I'm gonna talk about something here in a moment that that's partially true. It's gonna create things at the forwarder, which is Gowan, but to get things working, you have to make sure that you run the right stuff on JY because it's that's within the AG, local AG there. So now I'm gonna run this on Gowan, which is gonna be the forwarder. Okay. Now, good. Another thing I need to point out here is that there is no automatic failover with a distributed availability group. It's always manual. And it's a general rule, not really a rule. You should only run it as asynchronous. The only time you're going to switch it to synchronous is when you're going to do a controlled failover. But it other than that, you shouldn't be running these things sync. That's not how it was designed to work, okay? So now let's go and see here. Well, if I look at Gowan's SQL Server log, and again, I apologize that I'm craning my neck here, but I'm looking around the camera. So if I go look at my SQL Server log, I should see that, well, first of all, you can see a bunch of stuff here, but oh, hey, it's, first of all, this is connected with JY, so which is good, but you'll see here, it's connected with this, right? Renegade AG. So you can see it's doing stuff around the distributed availability group. It's all stuff we want to see. Now, if I refresh Gowan, so first of all, you can see that this is not refreshed. If I go refresh this, look, seeding created this database. Now, if I go look here, hopefully, this got created. Awesome. So if I go look over here, and that was those other messages that we were looking at. So if I now look here, I should see a distributed AG called dist AG, which I do. Now, I want to point something out very important here. You're going to see the distributed AG here. You'll see the that the names of the AGs, but you can't do any administration here. You can't that all the real administration is done in T-SQL. Okay? So just be very aware of that. So if I go back up here on Dennis and I go refresh my availability groups, I should see there's my distributed AG. Again, I can't really see much here. Great, right? So we'll come back to failover in a minute. Now, let me show you a query that you can run. So this is against Dennis here. And you notice it's like, oh, it's healthy and it's secondary and it's not behind and awesome. All good stuff. So that's what we want to see. And these are the types of things you need to write. Now, this is a typical one that I, I have. You can customize this. Now, if I took this wear out, by the way, just so you know, it would show me everything. I could obviously do other filtering on this. But... Again, kind of nice, right? Everything's all matchy, matchy. Great. So for grins and yucks, let's move the distributed AG, or should I say, let's move the primary of the global, which is also the global primary from Dennis to Tommy. 
Taking my life in my own hands here. So it's synchronized. Normally I wouldn't use the GUI, but hey, it's demo. Should fail over. Any day now this will finish. All right. Nothing like recording a demo and just having things wait. Okay, so if I now execute this against Dennis, you're not going to see the distributed AG. So if I connect to Tommy, you'll see here that again, the distributed AG. So that proves one thing here, and that's that the distributed AG when you have when the main primary AG or the one with the read write copy of the database fails over things really do just work and continue so you don't have to worry about that so that's a good thing but what happens when you want to actually do a failover now why would you want to do that so first of all I didn't list it in the use case scenarios, but another big one is not just DR, but testing DR. Now, what do you mean, Alan? Test DR? Yes. Test disaster recovery. Now, I'm going to get into licensing around that right now, but the thing is, if you are looking at you know, the or, or not just testing DR, but I also have customers, for example, that run a data center, say, in one area, and they have a data center in another area, and they have to flip-flop between them every now and then. There aren't a lot of features or technologies that allow you to do that, within not only within SQL Server, but fairly seamlessly. Okay, so now we know our distributed availability group is working. So let's just go back to that query for a second, and we'll look at some of the last... So the last received, last redone, last hardened. Okay, last hardened time. So let's go insert a record. So now that we're connected, let me connect to Tommy. So I'm gonna use that database and just insert a value. Nothing too weird. But if I go look at this, some of this stuff should change because, well, let's just, you know. And it did. Awesome. That's what we want. And, you know, it's just one of those things, right? So, okay. Great. Now that that's all set, let's look at what the failover process is. And this is definitely not super straightforward. This is from an earlier test I was doing. So it's asynchronous now. What you have to do is set them to synchronous. Now, as I said, this is about the only time you're gonna to wanna to do that because you don't wanna run it as synchronous all the time because you know we're talking, you're doing this over distance. I don't know why things keep uh, moving on me. Okay, hitting the wrong button. Okay, so I'm going to execute this against Tommy because it's a primary. It's a global glo global primary. So set synchronous. Oh, well, it would see I'm human. Okay, now I need to run the same thing on. The, the forwarder. So now if I go back over here and run this query, So things should be copacetic. That's good. Nothing changed here. Now, 
The other thing I want to look at here too, for example, is am I synchronized? Is the end LSM the same? So you can see some of that over there, but I want to show you just in the smaller query. So let's get Tommy. Could have changed that there, but eh. See why doing the uh, friendly stuff is a little better? So it says synchronize. That's what we want. And you want to make sure that your synchronized stuff looks the same, which we saw over here. So what I'm going to actually do at some point, I'm going to merge those scripts. But you notice the last commit, last hardened, all that stuff. So we're looking good. Things are in a state where I could fail it over. Now, what you have to do, which again is not straightforward, you have to demote what is the global primary to be a secondary. And then you promote the forwarder to be the primary. Now, even though we said it's synchronous, you still are forcing a failover because this is manual. So let's Okay, so now if I go run this over here, remember I was running it on Tommy. It's just showing me the AG over there. I've got to connect to Gowan. For me to now see the distributed AG. Aha. So I've completely failed over and everything is copacetic. Now, what happens if I want to fail back, right? So let me do the same. So I'm already connected to Gowan. I'm going to insert a row. Oh, that's not T sequel that we're looking for. So notice now that I can insert a row on Gowan, right? Because it's the global primary. And one thing I didn't show you, but Tommy, which is the primary of Renegade AG, if I go look at the AG, it says synchronize, but if I try and do stuff, let me just refresh this real quick. I, I can see things, but again, it, it's not a, a, a writable primary over here. It's the global forwarder. Okay. So if I try and say connect to Tommy, see? Even though I can kind of do some stuff here, it's not letting me. That That's what I expected. Awesome. I like when things work. So now if I go execute this query, we saw that it was these LSMs before. It should be incremented some. Because so I'm still synchronized. I never changed it, right? Let's do a flip back. Let's assume we just went through this whole rigmarole. And... We want to flip back. So what I'm then going to do, we were already in synchronous because I didn't do the extra step that we're going to do at the very end of this. Then I'm going to demote Gowan and then from Yeah, typos. It's live. Go to Tommy. 
and we'll give it a minute. And if I go back over here, and if I issued this against Gowan, which works still connected, notice again that the distributed AG isn't showing because it's not the global primary. It's a forwarder now. So if I switch to Tommy and run this, hey, hey. So what you would normally do is once you do that flip over, you would set this back to asynchronous. And all will be right in the world. So you have to do it against both the global primary and the forwarder. And you're back to normal operation mode. And if I go here, that's what I expect. It's everything looks healthy. I'm going to go here. I'm connected to Gowan. I'm going to switch back over to Tommy for a second. I'm going to insert, because you saw I couldn't insert anything into Tommy. Now if I do this, I should be able to, which I can. And if I try and do it against Gowan, it will not allow me to do that. Awesome. That's really what we wanted, right? So at the end of the day, this is all just working. It, and as you can see from a DR perspective, we can flip back and forth. Now, obviously, you may have some data loss or if, if it's an unplanned, right? This is all planned. I could control this. But if you want to test DR or flip data centers, when you're doing things like migrations with all scripting and stuff like that this stuff just happens really really quickly so it's it's a nice look nice nice feature you can also do your uh, or initiate your databases manually uh, through backup copy and restore i'm not going to go through that process but understand that that is a possibility and there you go you've seen a failover i'm oh, sorry just a backup you've seen the underneath the covers, the two separate clusters, you've seen the creation of the distributed AG, you've seen a failing over of the global primary and it still works, you've seen a failover of the distributed AG and failing it back. So I covered a lot of ground here in this demo. Oops, there's one thing I mentioned earlier that I said I was going to show that I didn't. It's really important. I'm going to go back to failover cluster manager on both sides. And you'll see here, again, just clicking to show that this is all live. The distributed AG doesn't show up here. Again, showing here in Failover Cluster Manager. So remember how I said it was a SQL Server only construct? It truly is just a SQL Server only construct. First, before I wrap things up, let me apologize. I don't know what happened there technically. Somehow my head got really big. Something happened with the camera, but that's fixed now. Anyway, a couple of things. A lot of this you saw in the demo, so I'm not going to regurgitate this slide, but a few things I do want to point out and give a little context to. There is no listener of listeners, or there is no listener for the distributed AG. There are just listeners on the individual AG. So if you're doing read-only stuff, remember that the read-only stuff will be in context of a local availability group. It would be it in site A, site B, region A, region B, what have you, right? Troubleshooting is a bit of a pain in the in this configuration. So everything's T-SQL. That's the management story. So you're, there's no perf mon counters. There's no real stuff in the GUI. There's a little stuff that you saw, but you might as well just ignore that. If you're not comfortable with T-SQL and querying DMVs and doing that kind of stuff, especially for troubleshooting, do not deploy distributed availability groups. Don't think you're going to run this thing sync. Um, I've seen customers get in trouble doing that, especially with larger things like index rebuilds potentially. So be very careful. It can work, but it's not what it was designed to do. The, the other thing that I want to say here is that it didn't really talk about this, but don't call it a DAG, just like you don't call basic availability groups bags. 
DAG is actually a feature in Exchange, and it's not the abbreviation here. It's called a distributed AG. So to sum things up, while they are certainly add complexity in a different way, they simplify, say, the cluster situation. You'll have a model with a cluster, cluster, but all the complexity now kind of moves back towards SQL Server more. But it gives you a lot of flexibility. I showed you that you can flip over from one basically data center to another, or one configuration to another. Now, obviously, if this is something like an upgrade, that wouldn't happen because as with all standard upgrades, it's a one-way street. But if you're doing like same version to same version, being able to flip back and forth and have a DR plan, that's pretty awesome stuff. If you're using standard, I apologize. It's not in standard edition. Hopefully, they'll add it in the future. But at the end of the day, I really do love distributed AGs. They're one of my top favorite features of the past 10 years of SQL Server, along with things like adding update source in setup. And a few other little things, or seeding even, right? So if you're going to consider them, you know, maybe you need to rewatch some of this again. There's more to it. I helped write some of the documentation for Microsoft. So the, I have a lot of investment in this feature, and a lot of my customers use it. I wouldn't recommend this feature if I didn't actually recommend it to my own customers. So thanks for tuning in. Enjoy the rest of your bits or whatever else you watch, and I hope to see you next year in person.